My guest today is Judy Dwyer, who in the fall of 2019 launched Allium Montessori, a micro school for children ages 6 to 12 that is part of the National Wildflower Montessori Micro School Network. The first Wildflower Montessori micro school opened in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2014. Today, there are roughly 60 of these micro schools across the US and in Puerto Rico. Most of them are private, but Wildflower public charter micro schools now also operate in New York City, Minneapolis, and Washington, DC. I visited and interviewed the founders of the Wildflower Charter School in the South Bronx back in episode 94, so you may want to check that out as well. And I've also visited Judy's Allium Montessori here in Cambridge. It's located just around the corner from me in Harvard Square and is a beautiful space that you can just tell nurtures childhood creativity and curiosity. So I'm so thrilled, Judy, to welcome you to the Liberated Podcast. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate taking this time to discuss Allium and the children we serve. I love what you're doing with Allium. I know um, when we visited, you said that the that your kids and your students call Allium a secret spy school because it's located in this beautiful space, kind of in the lower level of um, a, a really lovely church, even though, of course, you're a secular program, and it does sort of feel tucked away in this like secret little school, but it's not at all secret. You want the world to know uh, what you're building and, and certainly to attract more families who would be interested in the child-centered philosophy of Montessori education, as well as a micro school version of that that really enables you to um, to to pursue authentic Montessori education in a highly individualized way. So we'll we'll talk all about that and kind of your entrepreneurial journey. But I'd love to start by hearing what made you become an educator? What was sort of your path toward education as a as a career, as a vocation? It started as a volunteer stint, as you will, you know, I think in high school, oh what's a volunteer thing I can do? Teach a kid and tutor and help out. And so you do it through high school. You know, I started it in, I continued that in college. Um, I studied neuroscience as an undergrad at um, Johns Hopkins. And they have a really strong tutoring program with the public schools where they bus kids um, onto the campus. So it's accessible for, for everybody. And you tutor these children and you have um, a mentor um, organizer, they call it, who help these new freshman tutors adjust and adjust to the children that they have, help them both have this kind of big brother, big sister type feel to it, but also help them with shore up some of their academic um, you know, weaknesses, as you will. And that's something I did throughout my time at Hopkins and throughout the three years. And I slowly kind of rose up the ranks with that. I was like, this is getting a lot of fulfillment from it. And simultaneously, I was being fulfilled. It was just like discovering the brain, nervous systems. Oh, like I loved my work, but I started to feel like, well, what is the next step for me um, professionally? And I was working in a lab and I loved it. I was a well-funded lab. I loved my colleagues. I loved the research, but it still didn't have the dynamicism that teaching does. And I realized that's what I actually wanted to do. I get, I love how there's, there's a moment you can plan for like, you know, you can spend like an hour planning a you know 20 minute lesson and then you get in that 20 minute lesson and that can go out the window because that kid is coming to you with more background knowledge than you realized or not enough background knowledge. And I love being able to have, um, to think on your feet and then get those smiles from the kids when they feel like, oh, I learned this or the humor that you have with the child when you kind of just like have that inside joke or those aha moments and the pride. There's a lot of emotions that are on um, anybody's face, but also the face of a child and just helping them guide them through that day is just an rewarding experience. And so I cross-registered with the School of Education and pursued my master's of teaching so I could teach right away out of college because I didn't go to a teaching college. Interesting. So, you know, you said you were, you were, you gravitated towards the teaching part, that that was what really um, 
kind of ignited your passion. And, you know, I wonder what it was about working with children um, that you were especially drawn to, because, you know, a lot of people would say, well, I love the teaching part. I'm studying neuroscience. So I'll just go off and get a PhD and teach in academia. And yet you really wanted to work with younger children. What was it about that age group that appealed to you most? I, th- I feel like teaching is also a way to give back to the world. I think I've been really privileged myself. And I think a good elementary education or a good primary education, just a good foundational education can also be a really wonderful equalizer in some ways. And so that's kind of always brought me to like, okay, so you want to kind of create some change. I think create empowered individuals, create empowered adults, create people who are aware of themselves and aware of the world that they're existing in. And to use kind of a Montessori term, figure out their own kind of cosmic task, their place and their gift to the universe. Um, And that's why I was kind of drawn to elementary. I think there's just this wealth of potential and a wealth of um, access I want to give students. Great. And so, so you said you, you got your master's in teaching and then what yes. happened next? Um, I taught in um, a Baltimore city public school. And so I kind of just campaigned to different public schools saying, yeah, take me on. Um, I know I'm a new teacher. I know there's a lot for me to learn, but you know, hire me. And so I showed up at a school with my resume in tow and said, hire me. Well, you know, you know, I would like to interview for a position. Do you have any positions available? And they happen to have a position available in um, pre-K, which I think is such a valuable experience because you also get the opportunity to work with a paraeducator, someone who really knows the community, knows the school, has seen the ebb and flow of outside top-down guidance and has learned to work within that system. And, and those, you know, those hidden closets of old materials are, and those, those keys to what to say to a family is so they really kind of let their tension and apprehension of talking to a teacher go. And so you can really just be there for the kids and not have as much baggage. And so what was that like for you? I guess, how long were you teaching in pre-K? Did you, um... Were you, did you take on any other roles at the public school or what was that overall public school experience like? Yeah, I taught pre-K for two years, I believe, and kindergarten for two years. And during that time, they're looking for um, student, you know, teachers who are interested in kind of like the larger scale as well. And so I was kind of like the representative, representative for the grade that I was at. I was teaching at the time. So like the pre-care representative or the kindergarten representative to these more like whole staff um, meetings and planning and strategic planning pieces. And I loved it. Um, At the same time, you know, burnout is real. And I realized I I needed to have a teaching philosophy um, that really represented who I was as a teacher, the values I had and the values of Um, the families and really more like responded to the kid in real time and I feel like there was a little bit of this disconnect of really wonderful rigorous expectations and really caring about children but it's the way it was being implemented was treating children a little bit more than the robots that they actually are and I wanted a system where I could truly implement my training um, all like the best practices in the educational world um, and could tailor that to the kids. And so then I started looking at different philosophies of education and I found Montessori. I was actually a Montessori child myself um, during my primary years. But, you know, being a Montessori child and knowing what the Montessori philosophy thing is two very different um, pieces. And so I rediscovered Montessori philosophy and said, oh, this is a comprehensive scaffold for best practices. I need to know more. Mm. And that's when I got my Montessori training at Washington Montessori Institute. Okay, yeah. So tell us for for listeners or viewers who may not um, be aware, you know, what is that process? You say, you know, people who might be public school teachers like you, you realize you want something different, you gravitate toward Montessori. What are the steps to become a Montessori teacher? So you go through training. (laughs) <laughs> as you will. And there's two different um, training um, 
methods, as you will, or kind of two training organizations from Monastery mm-hmm. within the United States. There is the AMI, um, which is Association of Monastery International training centers and then there are AMS certified training centers which are American Montessori Society um, certified training and so my training happened to be AMI training and it was the Washington Montessori Institute and many training centers actually also partner with universities where you can simultaneously get your degree in Montessori while also getting your degree your um your master's of education And so I had a year long intensive program for Montessori. And then I had a summer where I finished up a few more courseworks. So I graduated with, um, sorry, a master's in education with a Montessori concentration. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of like the master's of education piece. And then at the end for AMI degrees, you actually have a very traditional like final as you will, where you have a written portion and oral examination. Oh, wow. And so you have to pass that. And then you also have to do um, two longer inter- like, um, like uh, practice teaching internships, as you will, at AMI schools. Okay. And, and, there's also, and, there's, and there's also an opportunity to do it over a course, like a series of summers. Great. So if, it, if somebody was maybe a, a conventional, you know, public school teacher, they could go in the summers kind of working toward yeah. the goal of Montessori certification. And so then what happened next after you um, got your Montessori credentials and your graduate degree in education, what did you do next? Then I taught at a public Montessori school, which I really like loved the families, loved the community, loved the school and taught there for nearly three years until um, this opportunity to teach at a wildflower school arose. Um, I think like any, well, not any, but many adults, there's always this time where you're like, oh, what's next in the chapter of my life? And I was looking at um, the AMI job posting boards because I was thinking about moving closer to home which my mom lives up in New Hampshire. And I saw this opportunity of starting a micro Montessori elementary school. And I couldn't resist saying yes to the first step because what I was seeing at that moment in time was really hoping not just a beautiful Montessori environment for the students, but an amazing environment for the educators and the adults um, as well. And really kind of living into those practices and having more autonomy to truly adjust in real time to what we're seeing in our needs in the classroom. And so that's how my micro school journey started. Great. So you went right from um, being a public a Montessori teacher in a public Montessori school to launching Allium, really right into yeah. um, <laughs> education, entrepreneurship, Um, So maybe I want to hear about the entrepreneurial journey, but as a quick aside, could you tell us a little bit more about the philosophy of Montessori, Uh, obviously the founder, Maria Montessori, a wonderful physician and educator who popularized the idea of child-centered learning. Um, What, tell us what it means to you in terms of the philosophy. child-centered like hits the nail on you know nail on the head but to be truly child-centered and to follow the child you need to have a strong observational component and so this like idea of a monastery curriculum a monastery education is where the adults in our child lives are really observing the child seeing avenues of um kind of like planting of the seeds, avenues of these lessons that you can give at that just right moment in time at that just right skill level that are tailored to who that child is and best practices in regards to how that kid will learn. And it's a lot of hands-on project-based lessons. And this idea of removing the adults from the center of this to really kind of giving the student increased levels of responsibility. And I think there's a level, and it's choice too. And I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding that by following the child is kind of the child gets to rule all, but really within the Montessori, it's like you don't have true freedom if you don't actually know your choices. And so it's not a, you know, completely whatever a kid says, that's what you're doing is really intentional um, guiding of a child through progressions. 
of lessons and learning. Yeah. And, you know, with that freedom and choice that I've found in the, in the Montessori environments that I've visited and other, you know, similar child centered models, it's actually quite peaceful and calm that, you know, children are empowered um, and that empowerment leads to, you know, a sense of peace. Um, and so it's not at all chaotic when we think about children being the center of the, of the educational experience. It's really quite the opposite, I found. So you decided to um, become an educational entrepreneur. What was that process like? You said you saw sort of an ad to be a, a Montessori educator within the Wildflower Network. Tell us more about what that involved. So that involved um, meeting members of the Wildflower Foundation who know the community in which you're trying to open up a school well. And they have something called like a startup journey. And so you have your operations coach um, at the time. I think things might be slightly different now, but you meet with the operations coach. You kind of talk about um, the community and the community you wish to serve and a vision for a school. And so you kind of create this like, I don't know, like this dream manifesto, as you will, for the school that you want to open. And then you get to have this opportunity um, to present your plan for the school to many um, to different teachers who've already started a school as part of this advice giving process. And so you get advice, you adjust, and you just kind of start diving into this world with guidance. It's kind of like being a Montessori student and you're given like some parameters, but you're given some will, like from some freedom to explore. And there's beauty in that. You know, for instance, I gave a lesson on like the parts of speech earlier in this year. And I was like, oh, maybe you want to do, uh, like, so I gave examples of different follow-up work and they wanted to do a puppet show. And this puppet show has more from, you know, very like just stick figures with a very like clear background to this like 3D comprehensive background. It's like the Broadway shows of puppet shows. And it allows a lot of opportunities for the kids to learn how to work in a group, how to work, how to compromise, how to like, there's all these other skills. And so kind of like when you're starting a micro school, you already have an idea of what you need and your growth areas and what you want. But by collaborating with many different people, you actually have a, a better understanding of how you need to adjust, how you need to be flexible and actually create something that you weren't actually anticipating. And so that was really lucky with creating Allium. And so it's something that you apply for, you know, if others are listening or interested in being um, a part of the Wildflower Network, is this something that you apply for, you're accepted into, you go through this kind of incubator program, what is that support system like there? It's kind of more like an incubator program, yeah. as you will, and it's not a traditional application program where you kind of set something into the world and you just get feedback you're kind of collaborating um and co-creating as you will with people who are experts in how to do this and um it's, it's so wildflower network is actually a teal organizational model and so it doesn't mean that there's one person at the very top who says tells you no instead there's many different people who can kind of walk that journey with you and it can be tricky to navigate you need to um keep reflecting on kind of like what your needs are. You have to be a really effective educator. You need to be able to advocate for what you need. Um, there's definitely been times where like, that's been unclear. Like, can you tell me exactly what needs to happen? And then they also have to be comfortable with figuring out exactly what you need outside of the network as well. to like live into your vision. Yeah, and one of the things that the Wildflower Montessori Micro School Network really um, prides itself on and what sets it apart from other networks is this activation of teacher entrepreneurs, that it's really, as you said, much more of sort of a bottom-up, decentralized network that um, encourages educators like you who are passionate about Montessori education to go off and build their own programs. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, it was the first uh, Montessori, Wildflower Montessori Micro School opened in Cambridge in 2014. There's still a high concentration of Wildflower Montessori Micro Schools here in the city, um, you being one of the newer ones. And so what were some of those challenges as you got ready to launch in the fall of 2019? What were some of the, the, the startup challenges for you? 
Um, well, the startup challenges was finding space. Um, thankfully, we were choosing to start in a location that already had a strong network of other wildflower schools, which meant that I had kind of collaborators um, and advice givers um, for certain aspects of like, okay, how do you market? How did you advertise? Um, I had parents who were interested in starting an like an elementary version of a micro school for Montessori, sorry, Montessori micro school. But space was challenging because what we were looking for as an elementary program is accessibility for the children to go on going out and field trips and really get to know their community. So we needed a strong, a good place that was good for like um, public transportation. We needed a big enough space for the children to have these large scale timelines and projects and creations. And and we needed a space that was affordable so we could really truly live into our mission of, of increasing access to Montessori and helping families by kind of keeping our tuition as low as possible. We're adding um, Montessori as a more attainable goal for all families and especially with a strong um, desire for substantial scholarships for families as well, we needed to keep rent down. And so that was a struggle in Cambridge. Cambridge is a city, you know, <laughs> and you have city prices um, and you pay, pay by square footage. And like, of course, you also wanted like a working kitchen. So like there's all these different kind of parameters. And so we explored, there was one space I looked at it was actually tied to a restaurant. <laughs> there was one space that, you know, was potentially within different kind of community centers, which actually some good options there. And we ended up being um, in a space tied with a church which is actually kind of historically a lot of micro, like a lot of Montessori schools are actually attached to churches because they have often space that is not used on a regular basis. And so you can actually beautify the space and kind of embed yourself in the community, even as a secular entity. Yeah, and I'm seeing that true in micro schools of all different educational philosophies and approaches, sort of partnering with churches, as you say, because they tend to have space that's not used during the the week, the work week or the weekdays and tend to be a little bit more affordable than other uh, available spaces. And you mentioned that affordability is a key priority for you just to, in terms of some context, there is a more of a traditional private Cambridge Montessori school uh, here in the city that is $40,000 a year, which is sort of typical for secular private schools uh, in the kind of greater Boston area. The city of Cambridge itself, uh, the public schools spend $35,000 per student per year um, on, uh, on students. And then for you at Alley and Montessori, you're at a tuition of $22,000. So I'm really trying to make this more affordable, still obviously financially out of reach for many families, but more affordable than other secular private options in the city. And like you said, you tried to defray tuition costs when you can with scholarships and fundraising and all kinds of things. You're a recipient of the of Avela Education Fund micro grant um, that you know, can also help to provide scholarships and so on. But it, but affordability and space tend to be the challenges I hear most often. Now you had the added challenge of launching just about nine months before everything changed in education with uh, COVID in the spring of 2020. I wonder if you ever thought, you know, as a, as kind of a new entrepreneur and running this startup, if you ever thought, gosh, we should just throw in the towel. I mean, did you ever have that moment in 2020 specifically of, you know, entrepreneurship is hard and I didn't expect a global pandemic in the midst of all of this? You know, like, as you mentioned, I was like, maybe I should have thought about it, but I didn't and I think that was because all of my energy was going into just like collaborating with families like the families that we had is like so we were in this together I think that's one of the benefits of, of like a micro school is I already had a strong connection with the families that I was of the students I was teaching and so together we're like so what does this landscape look like what do you need what do we need how can we kind of get through this together and we were all doing this to reside even this like small amount of consistency for the kids. 
Like we, we knew they needed something. And so because, you know, you go into education for the children, the children are still there, even when the pandemic hit that we kind of just kept trying to keep our doors open and adjust accordingly. And I learned about Zoom. I learned way more um, about pandemics than anybody ever thought they would know, just like everybody else on the planet. And about how important it was to kind of just think about the priorities and, and kids surprise you. And I think that's what kind of kept us going is the resiliency of children. And we just kept following them and we kept existing and kept adjusting and giving each other breathing room and space and, and having humility and being okay with the inevitable amount of mistakes that was going to occur in everybody's lives as we navigated the new step. I love that tenacity and the fact that you never even really thought about doing anything different. You never thought about shutting down. Uh, I've heard this theme lately when I've talked to entrepreneurs, especially those like you who may have started right before um, the pandemic, similar commitment like oh it never even occurred to me that we weren't going to do this meanwhile you know there's so much turmoil and unpredictability so I think it's just a testament to that entrepreneurial spirit and that drive to push ahead um, even when surrounded in this case by sort of historic um, disruption and unpredictability and you came out the other end successful so tell us a little bit about your kind of student population now I know you serve uh, school age children ages six to 12, a lot of Montessori schools in general and wildflower Montessori micro schools in particular um, focus on preschool age, but you are serving school age children. You're also a recognized private school. Many micro schools operate um, sort of in the gray area between private schools and homeschooling, but you are a recognized private school. So tell us about what your school is like today. So our school is like today is we serve um, 17 students and it seems it is such like a little privilege to do so. So we're kind of in uh, pandemic adjusted years, like our two and a half, but this is going into our fifth. And so I love we that. have, pandemic we're teaching 17 years. kids. Great. pandemic adjusted years. And so we're still a young program. Um, we've built up first through fifth grade, um, we're divided into kind of two, two rooms that have some fluid connection between the two. We have lower elementary, which is first through third grade, and upper elementary, which is fourth and fifth, soon to be adding sixth with the lovely educator, Mary Velasquez, um, leading that and creating that strong upper elementary program, really just truly rooted in going out into the community and serving the community. And they're doing this really fun, um, program right now on food science. And so really understanding plants, researching plants, the history of plants and how they're kind of shaped by kind of cultures at the time. And this will really arose out of this ability to like go to the farmer's market on Tuesdays. So like we walked to the, they walked to the farmer's market on Tuesdays. They budget, they buy their vegetables, get really excited about buying like the largest cauliflower that they can find. And they were going to the farmer's market because they had, we had, even from the beginning, we actually um, volunteered with Friday Cafe, which is just across um, Cambridge Common, which is this beautiful park and has a playground attached to it. Um, and so Friday Cafe is this time where food insecure individuals can have a delicious meal in, um, in a peaceful area, right? And so we had first graders, um, they were manning the dessert station prior to the pandemic and really loving just like handing out desserts and that practical life of using tongs and getting to know a diverse group of children, um, individuals. And then after the pandemic hit and Friday Cafe reopened, they were just cooking meals for Friday Cafe. And so they haven't yet gone back to serving, but right now they're um, baking, sal you know, baking, making salads, grain salads, you know, vegetarian lasagnas and things like that. Um, so that's kind of this idea. We have a really strong upper elementary program dedicated to kind of service and exploration. And then we have this really strong um, lower elementary program where the kids are just learning how to kind of categorize the world around them and you know learning how to read and make sense of the world um and we have these families that are so absolutely like 
a joy to kind of work with because they trust education that you were giving to the child. They trust the Montessori method um, and they are here for the kids first. And so as we think through what we want to do as a school, we always come back to what's going to best serve our kids and what's going to best serve our community um, instead of having kind of adult at the center, the kids are at the center. Yeah. And what are you finding is drawing parents to your program? And, um, you know, what is it specifically about the micro school model and Ali and Montessori in particular that's drawing them? I know you said you have um, slightly more boys than girls in your program, too. I wonder if there's uh, something to that that's also attracting parents. Tell us about what you're finding parents are wanting. Yeah, so we're coming, some parents are coming us through the Wildflower Network, like they found a primary program when their child was three, and it was a Montessori micro school, and they loved it, and they loved the fact that they had greater agency, they loved the connections with the teachers, they loved knowing who was going to be their child's teacher and having that teacher be consistent for that child across that three year period. And so when they were looking for the next step, they were looking for another elementary micro school within the Wildflower Foundation, like Allium and Wild Rose is also in the network and in Cambridge. And so they just kind of wanted that continuation. You can kind of think of our schools network as kind of like a decentralized school. You just have the different classrooms in different areas and you kind of go through them. Um, and then other people find us because it's not working at their kids' current school. And so that might be early on in first grade and they're realizing, wait a second, there's a disconnect here between my student as a learner, my our children, our family's values, and my kid's not thriving, what else is out there? And so they start kind of casting this really wide net and then find us. Maybe Mon they knew about Montessori in the past, maybe they had no idea, but they kind of fall in love with the idea of those just right teaching moments, hands-on learning in very intentional curriculum with these progressions that the kids. And this idea of like, oh, I need my child to actually develop these social emotional skills. Like those are important too. And they want that whole child and not just an aspect of the child to be valued. Um, and then some students find some families find us um, because their children's age is such where, you know, kindergarten is not the right fit academically, but first grade wouldn't be. And they want their child to be challenged in all areas. And so just like all adults, <laughs> all children are not don't have the same passion for each subject areas and are not exactly equally um, don't have an equal ability in all aspects of their life right so you might be really strong in math and really needing to learn your letters and you might so then having a mixed age classroom um and a philosophy that's aligned with like you can be challenged in math while still having um time to learn and name name, name your letters and so like that fits to this idea of like a rigorous program for their kid um where their kid can be known and valued as attracted for families mm. I love that. And we're just yeah. seeing so many more parents uh, attracted to micro schools and to this focus on individualized learning and more focus on child centered learning. And of course, Montessori has been uh, championing that for many years and wonderful to see more families realizing the possibilities beyond a conventional classroom uh, for their children. So Judy, as we begin to wrap up, I'd love to hear your advice to uh, other teachers, particular, uh, particularly other teachers who might be listening and might want to make that jump from teacher to teacher entrepreneur. And what advice would you give them? Um, it's, so, it's so hard. I think it's like know yourself and be humble. I feel like it's like those, those bigger pieces and ask questions. Um, because then therefore you're going to be able to access the supports you need because opening a school, going down this field, it's not a one person task is the task of, um, it's only successful with collaboration and partner with someone who, um, has, has complementary visions, but not necessarily the same vision can, so can flush out your, um, your weaker areas. And so I've been really lucky to kind of do this journey with different people who had different strengths than my own. And we can really kind of 
um, come from another. And then, you know, take risks where you can um, and find organizations and means in order to take those risks. And so one of the, I think the great things about the Wildflower Foundation is you can take those risks within this like safety blanket where one's own personal money isn't on the line. And that makes a big difference, right? Like I would not have taken this if I had to take out a loan in my own name. And you're into being really aware of what you're doing. And then also knowing your limits too. If certain things had gone where like I wouldn't be paid a living wage my first year, or if I had to take on the burden of a risk that could have hurt my own personal life as well as my professional life, like this would not have been something I would have gone down. So that benefit of connecting with um, an established network sometimes is that it takes away a little bit of that entrepreneurial risk yeah. on the front end and makes it a little more palatable to jump in. So that's great. And even if that's not possible, your advice about collaborating with others and getting advice and, and realizing that there's so much you can learn from the people around you um, can be hugely beneficial. So Judy, if uh, my listeners and viewers so want, yeah, I've been to, very lucky. <laughs> to, yeah, want to learn more or local parents here in the Boston area are curious about yeah. Ali and Montessori for their own children, what's the best way for them to reach you? Um, you can visit our website, which is like aliamontessori.org. Uh, and then um, you'll see different ways of kind of contacting us. Or you can just contact admin at aliamontessori.org and we'll get all your, <laughs> your emails, <laughs> both applications and just um, advice. And please do. I, um, I've been really lucky in this experience and any shred of wisdom that could be beneficial to somebody else, I'd love to share it. Wonderful. Well, best wishes for you. I hope more and more people discover your secret spy school, as your students call it, this beautiful location yeah. in the heart of Harvard Square that's offering such a joyful learning environment for elementary school age children. So best wishes to you. And Judy Dwyer, thank you so much for being on the Liberated podcast. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate my time together.